Well, let's jump into what I want to talk about today. This is my year. I just want to say to you, starting off, Happy New Year's. Now, you know, one of the things, thank you very much, one of the things that I struggle with is how long do you say that? Happy New Year. You know, uh, wherever you go today, people will be saying that to you. Strangers will say that to you. Out on the street, as you go to a store, as you go to a re restaurant, they will wish you a happy new year. You know, how long do you say that? Do you just say it today and then forget it? Or does that go for several days? Does it go for several weeks? And when I think about that, I just want it to go on all year long. Because I like the ring of new that is connected to the year. And I love what is connected to those two words, happy. I just want a happy year filled with all kinds of new things. You know, I love new things. We all do. You know, there's nothing like new things. In fact, I'm wearing new shoes. Brandon and Delaney bought these shoes for me for Christmas, put those on this morning, and I thought, wow, they just feel good. Thank you for these new shoes. And uh, they are great. Uh, some of you have some new things from Christmas. You have a new jacket, a new shirt, maybe a, a new electronic gadget, and you just love fiddling around with those new things. But you know, there's nothing like a new car. You know, when you go to a car lot and you slip into a brand new car and it's got zero miles on it, and, and it's just that new car smell, there is nothing like it. And you know, you buy that car and you drive out of the lot with that new car and you turn around to your family and you say, we have a new rule in this home. We're not going to eat or drink in this car. We're not going to do it. Many just love the new of that car and one month later, the kids are in the back seat eating their Big Macs and their french fries are falling in between the seats and someone drops a Coke and spills it in your new car. And, and yet what happens is that uh, the new just kind of wears off. And, you know, that's the fear of going into a new year. We're excited. It's a new start. It's a new beginning. It's a new opportunity for all of us. But just in a couple of weeks, less than a month, the new will wear off. We're right back into just another typical year, a year of struggles, a year of, of maybe trouble, a year of difficulty, living the same kind of year that you lived back in 2014 and 2015 and 2016 and now 2017 will be the very, very same. What I want to talk about today is I want to focus us just for a couple of minutes on just what I've, what I've entitled this message as one thing, just one thing. What if I could change one thing in my life this year? What if I could focus on just one thing that would make my life better? I want you to think for the next few moments, what is that one thing in your life? If you could change one thing, I mean just one thing, and, and you think about how that it could alter your life and it could change the course of your life, just one small thing in your life, think about what your life would be like in the next six months and one year from now if you just stayed to one thing and changed that one thing, how that, that everything would begin to change in your life. You think about one thing. What is it? What's the one thing that you want more than anything else in life to change? That maybe you've been thinking about this for a long, long time, and, 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 and maybe you've been thinking about it for years and years and years, that if I could just overcome this, could it be a habit that you've just never really been able to overcome? I mean, you've tried and you've tried, and, and yet if, if you could just overcome that habit, maybe it's a goal that, that you have never accomplished. It's a project that you've never really been able to complete. Maybe it's a relationship that you need to restore in 2017, or maybe it's a relationship that you need to put to an end. You know, I've just thrown out a few suggestions to you, and, and in your own mind, you, you know what you want to accomplish. You know that there is something inside that, that, you, that you want to accomplish, that you want to uh, improve in your life. And whenever I'm thinking about, or talking about one thing, just pick one thing, you're thinking, one thing? Man, I'm looking at my, my life, and my life is jacked up, messed up. I mean, I've got four things, six things. I've got ten things. Well, get your mind off of all of the issues and all of the problems. Narrow it down to one thing. Don't try to fix everything in 2017. But what's the main thing? What's that one glaring issue, that one problem in your life? What's the one big thing? And can you imagine what your life would be like this year if you could fix that one problem that one situation in your life. Now, what I want to do is I want to take you to a historical document this morning. And this document is one of the oldest documents in the world. It dates all the way back to 444 B.C. And it's 
found in the Bible. It's this historical document that is called Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an amazing story, and let me unfold it for you in the next few moments. And I want you to hang with me, and I want you to just sit very, very still and focus on what I've got to say for the next few moments, because what I say, I want to change your life so desperately. Nehemiah is working for the king in Persia. Nehemiah is what is called the cup bearer. The cup bearer is the one who tastes food, tastes wine, before it is given to the king to make sure that no one is trying to kill him. He's on the security detail, plays a very, very important part in the king's life. So he's the cup bearer. But he's more than that. He's more than just an employee. He's more than just someone who is working on the security detail. But Nehemiah has become a close friend to the king. And this is the reason why. Nehemiah somehow, in his lifestyle, has risen above everyone else there in the household of the king. And that he views Nehemiah as someone that is trustworthy, that is honest, a man of integrity. He's a man of his word. And the king likes being close to Nehemiah. He respects him. But Nehemiah is not just an employee. Nehemiah is a slave in the kingdom that has risen into the ranks of the king. 100 years before this, Babylon marched against Israel. Babylon took a gigantic army and marched against the capital city, Jerusalem. And they invaded that city and they knocked down the walls, marched in, killed thousands of people. They went in and they destroyed Jerusalem's temple, which was their pride and joy. I mean, they dismantled the whole thing. They tore down every building in the city. And the army did not leave until they finished their orders that they would take the whole place piece by piece, block by block out, and they destroyed all of the walls. And when they left there, Jerusalem had nothing standing. It was only a pile of rubble, a pile of stone. And when they left, they were declaring that Israel will never rise again. When Babylon marched out of that city, they took with them some of the youngest and the brightest of the Jews to take them back as slaves. If you'll remember this story, where a hundred years before Nehemiah, some of these famous people in the Bible were these slaves. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they were all slaves that were taken back. Now, a hundred years later, Nehemiah is a descendant of those Jewish slaves. Nehemiah now goes to the king, and he does something very, very risky. Because after a hundred years, he keeps hearing these stories of what his homeland was like years ago. He hears the stories of how this remnant of the Jews are living in the rubble of Jerusalem, hundreds of miles away, and he goes to the king one day and says, King, I ask you of this favor. Would you allow me to take time off to travel back to my homeland in which I have never seen? But I hear the horror stories of how my people are living and the deep poverty in which they are in. And let me go and assess the problem and see if I can bring benefit into their lives. Would you allow me to take time off? Now, I want you to think about how strange this is. Because Nehemiah is a slave. Slaves don't get time off. And yet when he asked for time off, the king said absolutely. And again, the reason why is because he respected Nehemiah so greatly. He said, Nehemiah, I will allow you to go and tend to your people. I'll allow you to go to see what, what's going on. And by my orders, I will write out a document and I will send you by my own authority that I will place you as governor over the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah spent months preparing, planning, getting everything together for his trip. And he took off and he finally arrived in Jerusalem. The Bible says that when he, when he arrived, that he spent the entire day and night circling the city, talking with the people. And what he discovered was far more devastating than what he had ever imagined. The level of poverty that these people were living in, they were devastated. They had nothing to eat. They were being robbed from every single day. And his heart broke over the people in which and how, and how they lived. Whenever they would raise any crops, 
the surrounding tribes and, and, and nations would rob them of their crops. Anything of value that they had, people would come into the city of rubble and take it from those. And so Nehemiah assessed the problem, and he comes to this, this conclusion that the poverty is so deep here, and the problems are so severe, and there is no city, and there are no walls. Where do you even begin? How do you address a problem this severe? And this is what he said. I may not be able to address all of the problems, but if there's one thing, just one thing that I'm going to accomplish while I am here, while the king has allowed me to come, there's one thing that I'm going to accomplish, and that is I'm going to rebuild the walls. And so he wanted to rebuild the walls that he might provide protection for the people, that they might now begin to, to form a new national pride that they would have a homeland inside of walls in which slowly they could begin to rebuild their city. And so what Nehemiah does is he calls all of the people in the region, all of the Jews together. He gets all of them, and there's not that many, but he gathers all that, that are Jews, and he stands in front of them, and he casts this unbelievable, compelling vision to them. And when I was reading this vision this week, I wrote this in the margin of my Bible. Nehemiah's one thing formula. And this is what he said as he laid out this whole vision before them. This is how it worked. Here's the problem. Here's the solution. Here's why. Here's how and why now. When the people listened to what he was saying, it was an impossible vision. When they listened to his words, they were words of impossibility and no one truly believed what he was saying. And yet, even though the words were impossible, they rallied around the impossible vision. Now, let me stop here for a moment. In 2017, some of you have obstacles and difficulties in your life that you would list as impossible. That the relationship with my spouse is in an impossible situation. What has happened in my family, what has happened to our relationship with our children, it's an impossible situation. What has happened to our finances? Don't know how to ever get out of the situation that we're in. 2017 is before us. And all you have to do is cast an impossible vision and let the invisible God begin to work in your life. Now, I came across something several years ago that I want to share with you. And it's called Smart Goals. If you really want to change your life, I want you to take a look at this. The word smart is broken down into five different words. Specific, measurable, attainable, re relevant, and timely. Now, I want to just go through these very, very quickly. Because whenever you think about S, S stands for specific. Let me use this as an example. You're going into a new year, and you want to change something about your physical body. Uh, you want to lose weight. You want to get in shape. And there is what is called general goals. A general goal will not take you past two weeks of the new year because it's just general. Because you're walking around telling people, you know, this year, 2017, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to feel better, look better. I'm going to be more healthy. But that's going to take you nowhere because it's a general goal. But whenever you allow it to become a specific goal, of where you start mapping out and planning out what you want to do in life. For instance, a specific goal would be where tomorrow I'm going to join the gym, I'm going to get a workout partner that will go with me every time, I'm going to hire a personal trainer, I'm going, to, I'm going to be very specific in how I'm going to lay this out, I'm going to go to the gym at least four times a week, and I'm going to stay committed to that, then all of a sudden you've put together a plan, a workable plan. The next word is measurable. It's, it's how you measure. Whenever you set a goal for 2017, you have to figure out some way to measure your success or your decline in what your vision is. That you've got to, to have somehow track how that it's working. So let's go back for a, for a moment. If you're wanting to lose weight, uh, one of the things that, that I found this last year, there was an app, uh, and it's called Fat Smart. F-A-T, Fat Smart. It's absolutely amazing because as you're tracking everything that goes into your mouth, you just type it in. 
it calculates the calories for you and it tells you and it comes up in red whenever you have gone past that calorie count that you have put in what that is it is a system of accountability and that you're able to measure every single day how you're doing you have to figure out how to measure if you're ever going to accomplish something great in your life the next word is attainable I mean, is, is the goal that you are setting, is it realistic in your life? The next word is relevant. Relevant, does it really matter? How important is this? Does it really matter? What, what is this going to do for you? And you have got to identify what that is. Is it relevant? And then the last thing is timely, and that you have to have a time frame. And you have to figure out, as I begin down this process, am I going to spend an hour a day on this? Am I going to spend one day a week? Am I going to spend this time, and here's a deadline, and here are deadlines throughout the year that I want to achieve these things? And simply, when you look at these five words, SMART goals, it just keeps you from being overtaken by distractions in your life, and distractions are the reason we don't succeed. Now, going back to this story, Nehemiah gathers all of these people, and they start taking all of the stone that is piled everywhere, one by one, and they start rebuilding the wall. When the wall starts being rebuilt, all of the surrounding tribes and nations in the area begin to take notice, and they go, uh-oh, Nehemiah is for real. They're really building the wall. And when they see the wall going up, all of these tribes in that area realize that if they build the wall, we will no longer be able to pillage from them, that if they build a wall, it will protect them from us, that if they build the wall, that they can live inside those walls and gain strength, and one day they can build an army, and this can become a major problem in our lives. Sanballat, who is in this story, is one of the leaders and he leads an opposition against Israel and against Nehemiah as he starts building. He starts off slow, and what he does is he simply sends people into the city. And they come in, and they tell lies and rumors about Nehemiah. They begin to discourage the people, saying, Nehemiah, do you know who he is? He works for the king in Persia. He's not who he says he is. He's going to deceive you. He's going to rob you. He is, he is not who you think that he is. And the lies went on and on and on. But it seemed like it never went anywhere because the walls kept building. Then he sent in armed forces. Sambalat sent in armed forces to fight those who were building the wall. But you know what Nehemiah did? Even though there were those that would come and fight against them, he would not remove the workers from the wall. He said, stay to the wall. Keep building the wall. Stone upon stone. Don't get off the wall. Don't hide behind the wall from your enemy. Just keep building the wall. And he handed every man a sword that if they had to fight, they could fight. But they would not stop building the wall. And the wall kept getting higher and higher and higher. Sanballat realized that they were in a serious problem with Israel. And so what he does is he sends a message to Nehemiah. A messenger comes with a letter and hands it to him. And he opens it up. And in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together. What, what Sanballat is saying to Nehemiah, stop building. Just put down your tools and come and meet with us. Let's go and have coffee. Let's have lunch. Man, let's have dinner. Let's just come and talk. Let's reason this thing out. Let's talk about why you're building this wall. Just stop long enough and come and meet with us. And he understood what his enemy was trying to do. His enemy was trying to get him to leave the important and to come down for the unimportant. That's the reason why we don't succeed in our great dreams and visions. It's because we have a great vision, a great dream, a great purpose, and we keep getting distracted, and we will leave the important to come down to the less important. In verse 3 of this story, so I sent messengers to them saying, now this phrase that he says here, he sends a messenger back to Sambalat, and this phrase is the phrase that I want to remember for the next 365 days. This phrase, I want it to burn inside of me. 
and I want to remember exactly what he said, and I want to say it every day of my life, because when he sent the message back to him, he said, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. I want you to say that with me. I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. And what he's saying is that I have come up on the ladder, I'm working on the wall, and I am not coming down because I've got one thing that I'm going to complete. I'm not going to let any distraction keep me from, from my main thing because this year we have to keep the main thing, the main thing in our lives every single day. And when you look at what you want to do, what do you want to finish? What do you want to fix? What is it that you need to repair in your life in 2017? And when you start that great work, stay on the ladder and don't come down. Stay to the ladder, stay on the wall, keep building the wall day after day after day and remind yourself that I'm doing a great work. I'm doing a great work and I'm not coming down. I'm going to stay to the, to the, the work. Sam Bellett sent four messages, four messages saying the same thing. Come and, and reason with us. Come and, and visit with us. And all four times, Nehemiah sent back a message saying, I'm doing a great work, and I'm not coming down to meet with you. You see, there are all kinds of distractions in our lives. Whenever you leave here today, you can have a passion that this is what I want to fix in my life. This is what I want to improve in my life killer is distractions he knew that if he came off that wall that if he left and went to meet them that they were going to kill him nehemiah knew it if they could kill nehemiah they could kill the dream if they could kill the dream then they could destroy again the nation of israel and what i'm saying to you is that whatever is burning inside of you stay on the ladder stay on the ladder stay on the ladder don't get off the ladder. Stay focused all 365 days of this year. Just stay on the ladder. So let me ask you, what is your great work? What is it? What is it that you want more than anything else? And again, let me go back to the physical, the physical body. And so many times people are saying, you know, I just, I just want to, I just want to look better, feel better, be more healthy. And, and you're sitting here today and, and you're thinking, you know, I've got some serious health problems. I have diabetes and I have high blood pressure and, and I'm eating unhealthy and, and I'm not exercising at all. And my wife is on me. The doctor is on me saying that you've got to change. And year after year after year, I'm not changing. And you know, and many times our excuse is, well, the Word of God says that, that there's an appointed time to die. And whenever God's timing for me comes up, then that's, that's when the right timing is. Well, God has an appointed time for you. But you also can have an earlier appointed time by the way you live. And it's not God's appointed time, it's your appointed time. The reason why that our physical bodies are so important to us, and for us to understand how vital this is, is that God has given you a purpose and given you a dream. There's a reason for you living, and you cannot fulfill the plans of God in your life with a sick body. Whenever you think about your great work, that your great work, and you see your children running around the house, and they're just small little kids, and when you look at them, that you realize, that's my great work. That's what I want to invest 2017 in. I want to invest in my children like I never have before. I don't want to allow myself to get so busy and so caught up in everything else that, that I'm not guiding them and loving them and spending as much time with them as I need. They're my great work. Whenever your kids grow up and, and now they're teenagers and late at night you go in their bedroom to check up on them and they're sound asleep in their bed. And you look at your teenager, who is now a full-size adult, and you're thinking, how in the world do they get so big so fast? And as you're standing there in the doorway, as a parent just kind of creeping on them, you can say under your breath, that's my great work. That's my purpose. My purpose is not to get so busy in life that I'm not spending the value of time that I need to spend with them. This is my great work in life, that I just want to spend more time with them, developing them, that they will become greater than I've ever been in my life. Maybe you're sitting at your desk at the office where you work, and there on your desk there's a picture of you and your spouse. And when you look at your spouse, 
Or maybe when you, when you look at your phone and, and there on, the, on, the, on their phone is a picture of you and, and your husband, you and your wife. And when you look at them, you say, that's my great work. In 2016, we fought, we fussed, we irritated one another. It wasn't a great year, but this is my great work. This is what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on building a relationship with my husband, with my wife, like we've never had before, and I'm not coming down, I'm not leaving the ladder, I'm not coming off the wall until I establish what I desire in my life. You've got to stay on the wall. You've got to stay on the wall every single day. And this story ends in Nehemiah chapter 6, in verse 15, where he says, And the wall was completed in 52 days. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. This city had laid in ruins, rubble. These people had lived in severe poverty for over 100 years until one man with a simple vision came in, and they rebuilt those walls in less than two months, in 52 days. The 52 days represent the 52 weeks of 2017. What can you accomplish in a year? If you just say, I want to restore a relationship. I want to have the best marriage I can possibly have. I want to have the strongest and the best relationship with my, with my kids that anyone could possibly have. I'm not going to get distracted, but I'm going to climb on that ladder today and I'm going to write it out. Now, I want you to listen to this. If you say when you walk out of here, this is what I'm going to do, and you never write it down, it is never going to happen. It'll never happen. If you really mean business today, and there's an area of your life that you want to change, you have got to sit down, and you have to write it out with your hand. Write it out and say, this is what I'm going to do. And you post that you put it in your closet, you tape it to the dashboard of your car, you put it on your refrigerator, you tell somebody else what you're going to do, and then you climb on that ladder and you don't come down until you accomplish what you want to accomplish. In 2017, as we live in the natural, we must be empowered by the supernatural. This is the great benefit that we have. The benefit is that we're not alone. The benefit is that you have Christ dwelling in you, and you can do the impossible. This is what I want to invite you to do, is that uh, when you came in, this card was there at your seat, and I want you to pull this card out for a moment. I'm going to go into a 21-day fast starting tomorrow. I'm not going into this year in my own physical strength. There are some things that I want to change in my life. There are some things that I want to accomplish more than anything else, and I'm going to accomplish it in 2017. But I'm smart enough to know that my flesh is weak, and I need the power of a living God. And where Jesus said that some things only come by prayer and fasting, and I'm going to start this year off by a 21-day fast and just setting up the whole year saying, God, this is going to be the best year of my life. And I want to invite you to join me for 21 days of where when you go home, again, write it out. You've got to write it out. You've got to write it out or it'll never take place. What kind of fast do you want to go on? What are you going to do for the next 21 days? Tell someone about it. Stay to it. Stay on the ladder. Don't come down and watch what God will start doing in your life. On the back of this card, it has types of fast. There's the full fast, the Daniel fast. That's what I'm going to do for the next 21 days. Uh, you can look that up on the Internet. Just type in Daniel fast. It gives you all the information. There's what is called a partial fast. You know, there are a lot of times that, that people will fast every day for 21 days up till about 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the evening, and then they will eat a meal, but they do that every day. There are all kinds of fasts that you can pick. There are scriptures here that you can look it up. You can study fasting. But fasting is something that absolutely will enhance your life. What do you want? Don't lean into your own understanding. 
but allow this to be what God wants you to do in your life. I want to end today by us taking communion together. And I'd like for you to take the cup that was handed to you, and I want this to be a very, very special moment. We're preparing for a great year. This is my year. This is my year. 2017, whatever comes, whatever difficulties, whatever problems, doesn't matter because it's going to be my year. It's going to be your year. And as you take out the, the top layer, the bread, then you peel back the, the other layer, which is the juice, let me remind you of what this is. Jesus said, do this often. Do it often. He talks about how that, that, that communion, and I want you to think about this for a moment, communion is a memorial of his finished work. That's what this is. This communion is symbolic because when we take the bread that represents his body, the juice that represents his blood, the very embodiment of Jesus Christ, today we're internalizing that as symbolic that when we invited Jesus Christ into our life that we internalize Christ and Christ is in us every single day. If Christ is in me and Christ is in you, then what's going to stop you from accomplishing your vision and your goal? Nothing. Nothing but you and distractions, and that's it. You know, when we walk out of a place like this, we will forget just like that what the sermon was all about. Remember this. If you don't remember anything else, I'm not coming down off the ladder. I'm not coming down. I'm going to stay on the ladder until I see this accomplished. I'd like to ask everyone to stand as you stand with me this morning. Bow your heads for a moment. I'm going to internalize Christ, His power, His anointing. God, help me to accomplish what I've never accomplished in life. God, this one area that seems so impossible, Lord, with you, nothing is impossible. What do you want? I want you to think about it. What do you want? Under your breath, whisper what it is. What do you want? What's that one thing, that main thing in your life that you want to do in 2017? And as we take this communion, let the breath of God breathe upon you. Enter into this 21-day fast saying, God, I'm going to, to fast. And when I feel the hunger, the irritation of hunger, it's the reminder that I'm not coming down off the ladder. Father, as we hold these elements in our hand, Lord, the bread represents your body. Lord, that you came in bodily form. God came to earth. Lord, the, the juice reminds us, it is symbolic of the blood that brings healing into our bodies. Salvation is because of the blood that we have a relationship with you. Lord, we're so thankful. God, today, this is not about religion. It's not about just some kind of ritual. But God, this is about a relationship that can change our lives. So, Lord, we thank you. We ask, Lord, now that you would bless this moment as we now take the bread. Let's take the bread together. And now let's drink the cup together. I'm not coming down. I'm not coming down. I'm not coming down off the ladder.